This new morning worship by one of the cultiest members of the metal leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses shows you exactly how cults control information. And it's a perfect proof of just how much this religion has changed into an overt personality cult. Don't forget to drop a like and subscribe if you haven't. Let's get started. The text for the day, Daniel 11.27, the two kings will sit at one table speaking lies to each other. And as long as there's been human kings, well, lies have been told to the populace. Uh, the Greek philosopher Plato said this, the rulers of the state may be allowed to lie for the good of the state. And over the centuries, kings and rulers and diplomats have perfected their skills in diplomacy and deception. This is how Gary opens his talk, by telling you, hey, Plato said one time that governments may lie to people, which means every single government is only lying to their people. This is how dishonest this cult is. They take just one quote that seems to support their argument, and they just use it to build whatever straw man they want to support their black and white thinking. He even quotes a time in the Bible of someone who lied to further support this straw man of an argument. In this case, the straw man is governments will always lie to you, but guess who will never lie to you? Until I come and take you to a land like your own land, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards. He was promising peace and security, wasn't he? Um, but, but you see, what they had to do first was surrender to the king in order to get this peace and security that's being promised. But the thing is, Jehovah had promised peace and security to his people long before this. Effectively, what the Assyrian was doing was offering peace and security apart from Jehovah God. You're probably wondering why the hell this guy keeps mentioning the promise of peace and security like it's a bad thing. And that's kind of Jehovah's Witnesses lore. Jehovah's Witnesses take the words from the beginning from chapter 5 of the first of Thessalonians' prophecy, where it says, Now as for the times and the seasons, brothers, you need nothing to be written to you. For you yourselves know very well that Jehovah's day is coming exactly as a thief in the night. Whenever it is that they are saying, peace and security, then sudden destruction is to be instantly on them, just like birth pains on a pregnant woman, and they will by no means escape. For Jehovah's Witnesses, this is a prophecy that applies to our days. Jehovah's Witnesses basically believe in a contradiction where the world has to be now worse than ever, but also believe that the world is leading up to this point when the governments of the world all achieve collective peace momentarily, right before Jehovah comes in and destroys everything. So Jehovah's Witnesses basically believe that the governments will lie and say that they reach peace and security right before before they are destroyed. Gary is extrapolating this extrapolation and applying it to another extrapolation he got from a completely different part from the Bible, implying that the Assyrian king was promising peace and security in a hollow promise, just as the governments are going to proclaim peace and security in the near future. Did you, did you follow all that? Because me neither. But if that wasn't convoluted enough, Gary is about to show you how the devil lies, and he's going to explain it mathematically. It's of note that the liars will often shroud or cover their lie in truth. And a brief uh, math fact can illustrate that uh, we've talked about this recently. You recall that anything multiplied by zero ends up in zero, right? So no matter how many numbers are multiplied, if there's a zero that's multiplied in that equation, it's going to end up in zero. The answer is always a zero. The tactic that Satan uses is to insert something valueless or false in otherwise true statements. See, Satan is the zero. He's a giant zero. Anything that he is combined with will be valueless, will be a zero. 
So look for the zero in any equation of statements that cancels out all the other truths. This is just insane, right? Not only did he use a terrible logical fallacy to tell Jehovah's Witnesses to not listen to negative things about their religion, he did that right after telling Jehovah's Witnesses how liars use logical fallacies to fool people. How can Jehovah's Witnesses watch this and not wake up? Well, because you need to turn off your brain when you're a Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witnesses don't listen to this critically like we do. They kind of learn to tune out most of it and just get the general vibe of the talk. In this case, liars mix the lies with truth. So if someone says something negative about your religion, just be on the lookout for even one thing they may say that it isn't true and use that to invalidate their whole argument. Because... That's what Gary is telling Jehovah's Witnesses to do. He knows about apostates. He has even given talks about what apostates are saying before. Now, what is another circumstance that, that could, might, quickly shaken our faith if we're not on guard? Well, it has to do with the apostates. Now, there's uh, something that uh, the apostates are uh, talking about and trying to put forward. The media has picked it up. Others have also picked it up. And that is our scriptural position of having two witnesses a requirement for judicial action if there's no confession. So he's saying that if Jehovah's Witnesses ever come into contact with any negative information about their religion, focus on anything that can be perceived as a lie and use that to build a strawman of them and an excuse to ignore absolutely everything they just learned. This is why I don't think it's productive to post clickbaity titles and thumbnails based on nothing but speculation and why I try to get my information right, even if I don't always succeed, because I know Jehovah's Witnesses are always looking for any excuse to invalidate reasons to leave their religion. And I really don't want to give them any of them. But let's allow Gary to tell us what the Bible has to say about the end of the world that should be coming any time now. Now let's go back to our, our scripture in Daniel chapter 11. It is a fascinating uh, chapter. Verses 27 and 28 is describing the time leading up to World War I. And there it says that the king of the north and the king of the south will sit at a table speaking lies. And that's exactly what happened. In the late 1800s, Germany, the king of the north, and Britain, the king of the, of the south, told each other that, that they, they wanted peace. They lied to each other, and they lied to the people that were following them. One gov, one, 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 in two weeks, we shall defeat France. What really happened? Well, the lies of both of these kings resulted in massive destruction and millions of death in World War I and World War II later. Jesus Christ, Gary, hold on. How can you be this convoluted and this boring? If you're confused about that King of the North and South thing, that is in reference to Game of Thrones. It's just a prophecy that Jehovah's Witnesses believe applies to whatever government they like for them at any given time. And he's saying that the King of the North and the King of the South, since they're both governments, well, they have lied because they said that they wanted peace and they said that it was going to be a short war, but both of them ended up being a lie when World War I and its sequel happened. This extremely reductionist and ignorant take of the world is really indicative of the kind of mythos you need to build inside of your head to be a Jehovah's Witness. Since the most relevant parts of this religion were created around World War I and II, down to them preaching that the world is worse now more than ever, Everything has to harken back to those events that are increasingly further and further away. Just last week, the Jehovah's Witnesses posted about how the last of them known to have suffered in German camps died already. And that's why Gary has to be this convoluted, because Jehovah's Witness ideology makes less and less sense simply by the mere fact that time continues to pass. 
but you have heard nothing culty compared to what Gary is going to tell us next. So when the attention of the humans is on the big lie, the hope for peace and security, destruction is going to strike them when they least expect it. Now, how can we protect ourselves is the question. Go down to verse 8. The Apostle Paul says, But as for us who belong to the day, let us keep our senses and put our breastplate of faith and love and hope of salvation as a helmet. So two things he recommends, the breastplate of faith and love. It relates to our figurative heart. See, uh, combining faith in God's promises, understanding the promises, and, and having a deep love for him is going to protect our spiritual heart. It's going to be a spiritual breastplate. It'll be of the highest quality. And then the hope of salvation as our helmet, it's going to protect our mind. So we're not swayed one way or another by the old system and the lies of the system. We'll stay spiritually awake. Oh yes, this is what the whole speech has been leading up to, an excuse for this cult to control what happens inside your head. After all, there's this verse talking about a helmet. If Jehovah didn't mean for his followers to use this verse as an excuse to tell people what thoughts are okay and which ones aren't, then why did he say helmet, huh? But the most overly culty part is yet to come. You see, before, Jehovah's Witness leadership used to write long and complex books to extrapolate the lessons that they wanted their followers to do. So they could gaslight them into thinking that they weren't obeying men, they were obeying the Bible. And these men just so happened to do a great job at interpreting it. Now, however, the leadership is done pretending. They demand obedience because. Now, in our day, there is another group of men that are sitting at one table, our governing body. They never lie or deceive us. We can have absolute trust in the governing body. They meet all the criteria that Jesus gave us to identify them by. We know exactly who Jesus is using to protect his people from the lies. We just must stay alert. Jesus Christ, our Jehovah's Witnesses are getting cultier and cultier by the second. That's what Jehovah's Witnesses are listening to all around the world. That they have to obey whatever the governing body says because they never lie. Except that's not true, is it? Jeffrey Winder admitted that the governing body gets things wrong sometimes, even if it was to say that they weren't going to apologize for it. So this is what we know from the scriptures and from our own experience as well. Uh, about how the light gets brighter in modern times. It comes about by means of the Holy Spirit through his channel of the faithful and discreet slave. He reveals it gradually and at a time that it is needed. Well, knowing this, then we are not embarrassed about adjustments that are made, uh, nor do is an apology needed for not getting it exactly right previously. We understand this is how Jehovah operates. He reveals matters gradually when it is needed. And also, the governing body is neither inspired nor infallible. And so it can err in doctrinal matters or in organizational direction. But this new narrative that we need to obey the governing body now and forever as our princesses is fairly new for modern Jehovah's Witnesses and definitely falls into personality worship. Also, which criteria do they meet, Gary? What are the requisites and the ways that we can tell whether or not they're approved by Jesus? Gary just sprinkles that in there, but it's based on nothing. Even Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe there's this criteria to identify the governing body. The governing body sort of just tells everyone that the faithful and discreet slave parable isn't a parable and is actually a prophecy about them because they are the faithful and discreet slave, you see. That's it, there's no criteria. How can modern Jehovah's Witnesses go from boasting to not knowing their leaders because their true leader is Jesus to saying that they follow and obey men in the span of one generation? So in review, how can we identify a lie? Look for the zero, any component in a statement or teaching that cancels out a Bible truth. How can we avoid being caught up in the cry of peace and security? Well, Jehovah has already promised peace and security and has clearly forewarned us that a false cry 
will soon be coming. And what table can we trust? The table surrounded by our future kings, the governing body. Our future kings, the governing body? What is this religion now? This religion used to be about pseudo-intellectual efforts of discovering the deep truths of the Bible, and the leaders of the religion just so happened to be the best ones at doing that, but they weren't important in your worship. Now, it's like the man behind the curtain got tired of being behind the curtain and is out saying, yeah, you know what? It's me, idiots. I am the one behind the curtain. And in fact, you should obey me for eternity and not the Wizard of Oz. Is, is that what the Wizard of Oz wanted? I actually have never seen the Wizard of Oz, so I'm just, I'm just going on context cues. This is why I wanted to cover this morning worship, because Gary, who, let's remember, is in charge of the service department, the most evil department in this cult that handles crime cover-ups, is overly telling all Jehovah's Witnesses that the way to salvation is by obeying these men and getting used to it, because these men will rule you for the rest of eternity. There's no mention of obeying Jehovah or Jesus. In fact, they're barely mentioned. The whole point of this talk is to remind you that everyone in the world will lie to you, but not the governing body, which is why they deserve your obedience as kings far more than any government. This cult is changing, and we might be seeing symptoms of radicalization. This is why I don't buy that they're going to go mainstream, because although they're relaxing some minor cosmetic areas of the religion, they're definitely reinforcing the obedience that a witness have to have, not to Jehovah or Jesus, even as a dog whistle for the governing body, but for the governing body itself. Also, this makes me wonder, is Gary so horny about our obedience to the governing body because he is an anointed, and he thinks that he'll also be a king in heaven when he dies? Man, I'd love to know who is in Bethel anointed. That would explain so much. So if you're in Bethel or a Bethel insider, please contact me on Instagram or something. But that's all for now. Thank you so much to my patrons, especially these guys over here who get to see videos in advance without ads, plus some bonus content stuff. Also, they get to ask me questions like Laura Digniff, who asks, what is your job outside of YouTube? At the beginning of your relationship with Rindala, you were still indoctrinated. Did you intend on converting her in the beginning or were you already on your way out well my job outside of youtube is technically uh content making not just not making videos but making boring uh, blog articles for uh, large corporations however since chat gpt I, I suffered in, in getting clients so um it it's 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 a little it's, it's not doing that well at the moment but that's kind of what i do outside of youtube i, I have uh, also like businesses online and shit like that but it's just it's just you know in a capitalistic system you have to have a lot of things as a job and yeah at the beginning of my uh, relationship with Rindala I was still indoctrinated and I did intend um, and convert her I, I prayed sometimes that she would, would would convert and I would try to like witness to her right but in return like she would also uh, try to witness to me <laughs> when when we went to like museums and, and there was like something proven or, or disproving uh, the creationism and proving uh, evolution. She'd be like, uh, uh, well, well what, what do you think about this? Like, she, she'd just turn it into, in, in, with me, uh, like turn the question because she would know that I would I would do that, right? When, whenever there was something that I could use for evidence of God or an intelligent design or whatever. 